From lake to desert, rainforest to the Arctic, plants have found a way to grow in every ecosystem on the planet. So join us as we continue our exploration into the quietly amazing world of plants. Cacti survive in hot and dry places. And as you may already know, they do this much thanks to growing like a blob. So they have plenty of space to store water. But what you may not know is that they also hold their breath during the day. If they were to open their breathing holes called stomata during the day, they would dry out so fast it would make their head spin. So instead, they only open them at night when the sun is down. A true weirdo of the desert is the Velvicia mirabilis. It can live for a thousand years, but it only has two leaves during its entire life. This works because the leaves continuously grow at the base while they die at the tip. If you live near one of the poles, your life as a plant is very different. The temperatures here are colder than anywhere else even in the summer. <laughs> and not only that, the summers here are way shorter too. The short growing seasons combined with the low temperatures make plants get really hard to grow here in the Arctic. So everything grows slower. And another thing that's different up here is that in the summer we have the midnight sun, which means it's light 24 hours a day. The sun never sets. And in winter we have the polar night, which means that the sun never rises. It's dark 24 hours a day. Plants here grow slower than in any other ecosystems, which means getting tall is not that likely. So if you look around in the high Arctic, you won't see a single tree. But if you look down, you'll still be able to find trees. Well, in a botanical sense anyway, but the height isn't very impressive. So right now, we're technically in the middle of a forest. And while it doesn't look like much, if you look down and look closely at it, you can find a ton of these tiny little things. And botanical-wise, they are trees, because they do produce wood. An angiosperm that decided wood was not for them is bamboo, which is actually a type of grass. Wood takes time and energy to grow, so instead they use as little resources as possible to grow as fast as possible. Since bamboo plants often grow together, each plant needs to keep up to be able to access the sun. As a result of this, bamboo can grow for a staggering 91 centimeters a day. Sand ryegrass grows on beaches, which, being close to the open ocean, means it tends to be windy. The leaves of the plants can be damaged by rocks, sand, and itself. The leaves of the sand ryegrass is shaped like a tin roof and plated with silica, so it can protect itself from its environment. Within the bryophytes, there's this genus called splachnum, and they grow on dung. But they had a problem. You see, dung is really hard to find. So how do they make sure their spores end up in the right place? Well, they created a smell that resembles dung and that attracts flies that want to eat or lay their eggs on dung. So when they come along, they'll land on the capsule and eat secretion. And while they're there, spores from the capsule will fall off and stick to them. So that the next time the fly goes off to some dung, that some spores will fall off and right into their ideal environment. In some places, mountains are so steep that avalanches and landslides occur, but plants simply adapt to it. In fact, some of them depend on landslides for survival. During a landslide, the trees are knocked over and the soil is mixed, exposing soil with few seeds in it. And here, there's almost no competition for sunlight, nutrients and space. So seeds come in and soon a meadow is formed. These 
plants will need a lot of sunlight, but without any trees to block it, they thrive. Seeds from trees will also come in, but it takes them years to grow to a length where they block the sunlight from the rest. And when they do, it's probably time for a new landslide anyway, starting the whole process over again. Another testing natural menace is volcanoes. If the ash from a volcanic eruption lingers in the atmosphere, the particles will block the sunlight and stop the plants from doing photosynthesis, effectively killing them. However, once the particles settle, they provide a lot of nutrients to the ground. And the newly solidified lava that has cleared the previous plant life now paves the way for the first stages of succession. Surely forest fires are too devastating to have any positives for the plant kingdom. Nope, not when there's fire resistant trees. Pines have tannin in their bark, which is the bitter stuff in red wine. And it turns out fire doesn't like that very much. Some species of eucalyptus trees keep buds protected under their bark in case of fire. And then they simply rebuild what has been lost when the embers go out. As with a landslide, when a forest burns down, you again get a lot of sunlight down to the forest floor. But not only that, all of a sudden, all the nutrients are available too. Seeds that are most likely to get there first are the ones that are already there. They wait in the soil, dormant until a fire kicks them into action. This group of heavy sleepers include lodgepole pine, eucalyptus, banksia, some cypress trees, sequoia trees, some species of spruce and green heath. In some forests, the species have adapted to frequent fires, while in other forests, a fire would be devastating. So plants are incredibly resilient, but they also have an amazing ability to adapt to changing situations, bringing life to the toughest environments. It's all part of the fascinating world of plants. Mm -hmm.